Arnold. I'm the Director of Student Ministries, and it is a joy to welcome you all this morning. Um, I want to share a few announcements with you. We have begun our Phase 2 uh, of the return plan, and so if you missed the special message from the session from last week, you can find that on our website. You can also find the details to our plans. As part of um, our Phase 2 plan, we're now offering Kids Perk, and so after the Time for Children, um, or there's not going to be a Time for Children, after... I don't know. I'm sorry. There is a time though. Yes. Yes, I'm sorry. There is. There's a time for children. Um, we will. You can leave with Lily and her volunteers um, for kids' work. Um, we are back to in-person uh, Bible studies and Sunday school for adults, and so um, you can find those at 10, 1030, um, 1010, depends on when the 9 o'clock service gets out on Sundays. And then for children and students and all the other adult studies, they are still available online, so you can find those on our YouTube channel. We are looking for Advent devotional writers, um, and so if you have something you would like to share, something that God has been teaching you, um, or you enjoy writing, I would love for you to contact Han Ong or Candy Phelps by August 1st and let them know that you would like to contribute to our devotional Thursday morning men's Bible study is back, 7 a.m., in the Fellowship Hall, um, and you need to bring your own coffee and your own food to, to be part of that, um, but they are back in action and having a good time together. Last Wednesday, we had our family bike night, and it was a great success. We had so much fun. There are pictures up and videos up on our Facebook page that you can find. Um, we had Kona Ice and our parking lot was full of wildness. It was great. Um, this, this summer, VBS is not canceled. It's just not going to be in person. Um, we're going to have a live VBS. It'll be for an hour, um, July 12th through 14th, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. And Lily and some others will go live in that hour and um, have fun and interaction for our children. On July 26th, we have our senior Sunday, our senior graduates will be um, completely leading our service for us. It will be a 9 a.m. service, and it will be out front, um, outside. And on August 16th, we have an incredible um, celebration party plan. It's going to be at Dover River Gorge. We have rented out the whole recreation lake out there. We are going to have lake baptisms and have dinner together out there. And so you'll be finding more and more information as it gets closer to that. Please join me in our call to worship. I'm reading from Psalm 89, 1 through 4, verses, verses 1 through 4 and 15 through 18. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Happy are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. They exalt in your name all day long and extol your righteousness, for you are the glory of their strength. By your favor our horn is exalted, for our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One. Please stand with us as we sing.
Please join with me as we pray together our prayer of confession, followed by silent confession. God of peace, without your love in Jesus Christ, we are hopelessly distant from you. You know the brokenness of our living, the emptiness of our pursuits, the futility of our hope for fulfillment apart from your power and your love. We confess to you our frailty, our great need, and our sinful condition. Redeem us, Holy One, by the saving power that raised from death your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. trust the forgiving love of God in Jesus Christ we are all forgiven As free and forgiven people, let us, as is appropriate, pass the peace of Christ. Peace be with all of you. for children um, so that we can still stay socially distanced. Sorry, I've got some... Okay, <laughs> maybe that's a little better. Um, so, it's great to see you all this morning. And my kids, just a, another little announcement, little instruction. Um, when we dismiss in just a few minutes, there's a rope over here. And Mr. Darrell, he's with us too. And on the rope, there are pieces of red tape every six feet. So if you could, if each child could just grab a piece of the tape, then when we walk out, hopefully we can t continue to stay um, distant. So, well, this morning I say hello, but I'm also going to say aloha 
Have you all ever heard that word? Anybody? Anybody? Aloha? That is a, a Hawaiian word, and it means hello, and it can also mean goodbye. It's just a greeting that they use in Hawaii. And um, my dad, he loved everything about Hawaii. He listened to Hawaiian music, he even got a Hawaiian magazine, and I would flip through all the pages and see how beautiful that island is. And then one day, I got to go to Hawaii. Oh. It was like a dream come true. It was so great. And we took an airplane there, because it is an island. I guess you can take a boat, but a plane's probably quicker. And so I remember when we landed in the airport and I got off the airplane, something happened. There was somebody there to greet me and they put a lei around my neck. And they said, welcome to the islands, welcome to Hawaii, aloha. And now the lei they gave me was made of real flowers and it smelled so good. And I just remember, it was like, where am I? This is the greatest place on earth. They're so welcoming and they want to include me and tell me they're happy to see me. And it just felt really, I felt like I was so special. Can you imagine if we like went to the grocery store and there's somebody there and they put flowers around your neck and said, welcome to Food City, come on in and shop. You would just feel really great. Or maybe at school, your teacher gives you a, a flower necklace every morning. That would be so fun, wouldn't it? Um, well, you know, the other thing I noticed was I wasn't the only special one. They didn't give it just to me. Everybody that came off the airplane got a lay. So old people, young people, um, boys too, even boys got this nice little flower necklace. Um, everybody, didn't matter if you're from America or if you spoke a different language, everybody got a lay. Well, and that made me think, um, one of the passages that Dan's going to read is the passage from Mark. And in the Gospel of Mark, or I'm sorry, Matthew, said it wrong, Matthew. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says uh, that we should welcome others. And when we do that, it's like we're welcoming him, and it's like we're welcoming God. And so God's kingdom is so big that he welcomes all of us. We don't have to speak the same language. We don't have to, it doesn't matter if we're boys or girls or whatever. He welcomes all of us. And we then, when we're welcoming to others, we're sharing that love of Jesus with everyone else, no matter who they are. So kids, when you're, uh, maybe if we go back to school, there might be a new person in your class. You can welcome them, maybe not with a flower necklace, but you can welcome them and say, hey, my name is so-and-so, and I'm just happy you're here, and I'm good to, it's good to be here. Maybe there's somebody new that comes to church. Hey, I'm Miss Lily. I'm so glad you're here. We all want you to be welcome here. So let's use that aloha spirit and welcome everyone um, in Jesus' name. So I'm going to pray, and then, kids, if we can walk over here and grab a piece of tape, we'll go out to the chapel. So parents, we're going to, since it's rainy today, we're going to be in the chapel um, for our kids' care time. So let's pray. Father God, I'm just thankful that your kingdom is so big that you welcome everyone. And I just pray uh, that you would help us to show that same welcoming love to others, to everyone that we meet, and to tell them that your kingdom is great and that all are welcome. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, all those Israelites, <laughs> grab that rope and head to the promised land. Bye, Moses. Good to see you guys all here again. Fantastic. Let's pray together. God, in your word in Psalm 119, verse 11, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. 
We pray this morning as we read and meditate on your word that it will be hidden in our hearts, that we be changed and transformed through your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Randy, Bob, for that beautiful music. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. 
The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its thorn, horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. In our New Testament reading, as Lily alluded, it's from Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 40. Whoever welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I've had a lot to do the last several months, as many of you may know, with kind of all this crazy COVID stuff and helping with worship and, and bits and pieces. And so I've been going to staff meetings regularly on a Tuesday. And a few weeks ago, we realized that there was going to be a perfect storm this week, that Sam needed to be on holiday and that Dave was going to have to be away in Louisville uh, to visit with his mother and was going to be on quarantine. And so they said, Dan, you're up. I said, okay. So in preparing, I mean, there's all sorts of things. If you can just preach whatever you want, you know, just pull something out of your file. And I was like, well, normally I like to look at the lectionary. And so these readings come out of the lectionary, which is the, the three-year cycle of readings. So this is not anything that I've kind of drummed up or pulled out or whatever. I've spent time over the last several weeks thinking and meditating about these words. The first page, the first paragraph, even the first sentence of a book is meant to captivate the reader. It's meant to draw them in and encourage them to carry on, get through this volume of work, to learn some new insight, to gain some new knowledge, to be challenged or read some plot twists or whatever. It's meant to do that. And some books do that better than others. You're all probably familiar with the Peanuts cartoon. Charlie Brown and Snoopy, and Snoopy frequently imagines himself to be a famous writer, a famous author. And every time he begins a work, he begins with the same words. You know what they are? Yes, it was a dark and stormy night. Now that introduction is actually the beginning of a real introduction to a real book, and it's touted as the worst introduction ever in the history of novels. 
is written by a guy named George, what's his name? George Bulwer Lytton in 1830. So it's been around a long time. It's been bad for a long time. The full extent of it, the first paragraph, this is how it reads. It was a dark and stormy night. The rain fell in torrents except at occasional intervals when it was checked by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets. For it is in London that our scene lies. Rattling along the housetops and fiercely agitating the scanty flame of the lamps that struggled against the darkness. I, I don't know what that means. That's it. So you've just heard, in its entirety, the worst introduction ever for a book. Now since the early 1980s, there's actually been a competition called the bulwer Lytton Fiction Competition where people write what they believe to be the worst introductions ever for books. Here are a couple of examples. As the sun dropped below the horizon, the safari guide confirmed the approaching Cape buffaloes were, in fact, herbivores, which calmed everyone in the group. Except for Herb, of course. Here's another. Corinne considered the colors, palest green, gray, and lavender, and texture, downy as the finest velvet, and wondered, how long have these cold cuts been in my refrigerator? So clearly those are not great introductions, or maybe they're good if the effort is to be write the worst. My favorite introduction to a book, not necessarily my favorite book of all time, or even in my top 10, but my favorite introduction to a book is a book that may be familiar to many of you. It was by Rick Warren. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. The subtitle to that book is what on earth am I here for? The first four words of that book. It's not about you. It's not about you. Your purpose in life, it's not about you. Here's the first paragraph in its entirety. It's not about you. The purpose of your life is far greater than your own personal fulfillment, your peace of mind, or even your happiness. It's far greater than your family, your career, or even your wildest dreams and ambitions. If you want to know why you are placed on this planet, you must begin with God. You were born by God's purpose and for God's purpose. Powerful, clear, succinct. We live in an age that is absolutely consumed by narcissism. There's a myopic focus for each and every one of us of self-absorption. And even those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus, who commit to being part of a community such as this, are not free from the pressures of that narcissism and that egocentrism that is so evident in our culture. Think about this. We gather together for corporate worship. Have you ever thought or had conversations like this after worship? I really liked, or I really didn't like, that sermon today. It's not about you. I wish they wouldn't use so much traditional music in worship. It's not about you. 
I really don't like the contemporary kind of music style. It's not about you. This isn't a sermon to talk about the traditional versus contemporary worship styles because I think our narcissism, our egocentrism in the church is evident in other ways as well. Many of you know that I've spent the last two or three years working on my dissertation, completing my doctorate, and I wrote and studied for those, those years on what I began to call the multi-inclusive church. And from my reckoning and my understanding, the multi-inclusive church is incredibly rare, almost non-existent. The vast majority of faith communities are full of people who look, speak, act, think very similarly. Who have very similar academic, educational, socioeconomic backgrounds come from almost identical cultural contexts. don't believe that is God's best or God's desire for Christian community. In fact, my own experiences of corporate worship, those that I, I remember and reflect upon that I feel moved me were in contexts where I really had very little idea what was going on. It was in a different culture. They were using a language I didn't understand. They were following a liturgy that was unfamiliar to me. It was in a, con a context that I really didn't know. But in the midst of that, my thinking began to change. And the question went from, am I really enjoying this? Do I like this? To, God, I, I really don't have any idea what's going on here. But I join with these people who are obviously fervently worshiping you. And I give my whole heart in worship because I know that you do understand. The last several months have been tough. It's nice to be gathered together even if we're separated. It's been hard to be isolated in that way. This pandemic has caused a lot of unrest and nervousness and some personal challenges and all sorts of stuff. And even more recently, of course, there's all the, the ethnic tension that has boiled over once again. And I think Sam has addressed that over the last couple weeks pretty clearly, pretty well. But it's raised a question for me. I wonder, I wonder why politicians, news media outlets, community organizers, community organizations that are dealing with this ethnic tension are not turning to the church for help with ideas for reconciliation. Because the church should be reconciliation central. That should be the place that everybody goes to when they need reconciling. These people get it. But the church has lost almost all credibility in that area. We have the words, but don't necessarily have the actions. You may have heard me say before, I keep coming back to this, 1963 Martin Luther King declared 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning as the most segregated hour in America. And more than 50 years on, almost nothing has changed. And when I speak of the multi-inclusive church, I'm not just talking about people of different backgrounds, nations, ethnicities. The multi-inclusive church in includes more than that. Think about 
the square mile around this building right here. How representative is our community of that square mile? I don't know. I know that there are people of all walks of life and educational and economic backgrounds. Many of them, for whatever reason, aren't here. My family likes to go to the beach. I don't know if you like to go to the beach. Hopefully this year maybe we're avoiding the beach. Just looking at pictures from the past. But we like to go. And if you've ever been, you know, you kind of unload your car, you get all your stuff out of the car, and you kind of head down to the beach. It's a hot day, and you can't wait to get in the water. And you're in your bare feet, but it's okay because you're going to get in the water soon. But you hit that sand and very, very quickly realized that sand is blistering hot. And you run. You run to any shade available, even if it means sharing the, the tent of someone who you don't even know. I just, before my feet melt off, I got to get there. It's okay. I'm a little vindictive. I, sometimes when I get to the beach, I like to turn around and watch the hot sand dance from time to time. Now, on overcast days, when the weather's cooler, we stroll, we take our time, there's no hurry. But on those days where it's particularly hot and intense, we gotta move. What is it that causes the movement? It's discomfort. Discomfort causes movement. When we're comfortable, we stay put. I'm convinced that God utilizes, in fact, maybe even orchestrates discomfort in our lives that we may move more into the likeness of Jesus. That's true for us as individuals. I believe that's true for us as a community. And so I ask myself, man, this season has been incredibly challenging and incredibly uncomfortable. What is it, God, that you would have for us? You're asking us to move. Where is it that we are to move? How is it we are to be changed? The Old Testament reading is familiar to us. We've probably heard multiple sermons about Abraham and Isaac and the potential sacrifice of Isaac. A little bit of background. God promised that Abraham would have heirs and that those heirs would become a great nation. And for whatever reason, Abraham thought, God is taking a long time for this to happen. And so, he began or tried to start a family on his own with Hagar. That did not work out so well. So eventually he has a son, Isaac, with Sarah. And it seems like, okay, we're good to go. But then somewhere, somehow, Abraham gets the impression that he is to sacrifice this son. Now this is the ancient Near East. Human sacrifice was not unusual. Abraham is the first called out by God. Who knows what his practices were prior to that? But human sacrifice was ordinary. Now think, he's gotten this promise from God. It seems like it's finally being fulfilled in Isaac. I'm an old man now, nothing else can happen. And then he gets this somewhere. I don't, it doesn't say that God spoke to him verbally, but somehow he gets the impression, I have to sacrifice Isaac. What does he say to Sarah as they're leaving the house? Isaac seems to get a hint that something is not right. He asks the question, we have the wood, I'm carrying it. You've got the flame and the, the knife. Where's the sacrifice? As if Isaac was alert enough to the surrounding culture to know 
this may be it. What was that about? Was it that Abraham had become complacent, had become comfortable, had kind of rested and thought, I've got the sun now, I'm good to go. I don't need to worry about this anymore. Was God instigating something so that Abraham would continue to, be, to move, to be challenged, to be transformed more into the likeness that God destined or designed him to be? I do not know. I don't know how that transpired. I don't know why that happened. But this I do know. As a result of that incident, Abraham and Isaac and all of their descendants afterward were completely transformed and changed because of that discomfortable, uncomfortable context, situation. The people of Israel, after this, the descendants of Abraham, are called out. This story is significant in their understanding of who they are. When all the other peoples around them are behaving and worshiping in all kinds of crazy manner, they look to this story and said, God calls us to be different. Our God loves us differently, demonstrates grace and mercy. It was transformational for them as a people. And it came out of an incredibly uncomfortable context. It moved the thinking and actions of Abraham, Isaac, and all those that followed. Now, I very much doubt whether those of us in this room have had any inclination recently to practice human sacrifice. Probably not. I hope not. But I wonder what is it that we cling to that we kind of feel comfortable in that prevents us from becoming who God called us to be as individuals and as a people. Is it our possessions, the things that we have, our home and our land and our cars? Is it our relationships? Is it our job security? I don't know. I know what it is for me or what it is at times. But this season has been incredibly uncomfortable and it causes me to ask the question, what is it, God? Where is it that you are leading me? Where is it you would like me to move? Because when I'm comfortable, I'm still and static. All of us might be willing to sacrifice some little things, give up something, think about our church community. Oh, we'd be willing to forgo this or that. It'd be okay, but there are certain things, whatever they are for each of us, may be different for all of us, that we hold as sacrosanct. This could never change, or I'm out. Maybe it's the architecture, maybe it's the music style, or the leadership, or whatever. I have no idea what it is for you. But I wonder, I wonder if this uncomfortable season if God may be calling us to be something more. Would we be willing to give up those things that we are clinging to, maybe just because they're our personal preference? If that meant that our lives and our entire community was more reflective of the community that God intended from the beginning, people of all walks of life, ages and genders and ethnicities. C.H. Spurgeon, famous preacher in the 19th century in England, he said this, 
We shall not adjust our Bible to the age, but before we have done by God's grace, we shall adjust our age to the Bible. What if we personalized it? We shall not adjust the Bible to ourselves, to our comfort and our satisfaction. But before we have done, by God's grace, we shall adjust ourselves to the Bible. What would that look like? May we use this tension and this discomfort that we experience now as a means to grow into the likeness of Jesus Christ, both as individuals and a community. Amen. Let's stand and declare the faith in which we believe by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray together as we seek God and also bring about the concerns of our community. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you bless us. Even the blessing that comes through discomfort. And we ask you open our eyes and ears, hearts and minds to what it is that you would have for us, that we would continue to grow in your likeness as individuals and as a family. And in thinking about our family, God, we remember these people who we care about and ask that you be with them. We pray for Dee Dee and Ron and Dot, for Virginia, for Marty and family, for Diane, for Alice, pray for Lou and Peggy, Becky and Bill and Bob, and we thank you for his movement from the ICU into a normal ward and pray for continued health in his life. Pray for Craig and Kaylee and Morgan and Josh. Pray for Nancy and Brianna, for Joe, for Brittany, for Rosemary and Jim. Pray for Brandy and her family, and for Kathy. Pray for Nate and Angela and their newborn. Continue to intervene there. Pray for Sue Jean and Martha, Heidi, for Jane, Ed, and Jean, for John, Pete's brother, pray for Mott, Josh, and Tamika, for Gerald, for Maria, for the Evans family, for Todd and Danielle and family. God, we pray for Reverend McDaniel. Pray for Marjorie and Richard for Tom and Kitty, for Regina, for Caleb, for Laura, Laura's family. God, we give you thanks for Dave, and thank you for the, that the surgery went well. We pray for Lily's family and the loss of their mother and grandmother. We pray for John and family. 
and for Karen and the loss of her son. And remember Sherry as well. God, as we've already acknowledged today, our nation is in the midst of difficulty, actually the world, between pandemic and tension and strife and uncertainty. And God, we ask that you intervene, that you help us navigate these complexities. For relations between people who lack understanding of one another, may we be understanding and may your spirit provide that link. We pray that you would continue through your power and through your people to instigate justice and peace in all the world, that all would know your justice and peace. And we also recognize, again, still, that this virus continues to impact and affect. So even in our area now that we're seeing a resurgence, God, we just pray that you would give wisdom and discernment and insight to those in leadership. We thank you and pray for those who are in area caregivers, first responders and medical personnel. We ask for wisdom for those making decisions about school and, and all those activities. God, we pray, as we always do, for the leaders in our community our nation and the world, that their first call would be to listen, to discern your will. God, in the midst of this, we recognize also that there are those from our community who we have sent out in, as missionaries in other parts of the world. And so we pray for them, the Goddards in Paraguay, our Ethiopian brothers and sisters with whom we have connection. God, we pray that you would be there for Christians in Nigeria and the violence that they are undergoing in addition to the issues of illness. For Nehemiah and Faber, our brothers and sisters in Brazil, for Fred Foy and Cecily, for Danae and her new placement, for Larry and Courtney. And God, we pray for this community our staff, our elders, deacons, leaders, and this church, and the witness of this church in our surrounding community. May we continue to be the hands, your hands and feet. The people would know this church by your love. And we pray these things in the name of your mighty son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue to worship God by presenting our tithes and our offerings. There are receptacles here and I believe also in the back. Let us worship God.
thanksgiving. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing the, sing the closing hymn and it's found attached in the back of your bulletin.
The last line of that hymn we just sang, the sure provisions of my God attend me all my days. Absolutely. Those provisions don't necessarily mean that we'll be comfortable. Sometimes God provision causes discomfort that we may continue to move and grow. Let's leave this place moving, growing into the likeness of the Son, Jesus Christ, in all we say and all we do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.